Um, so welcome everybody. It's great to see everybody here tonight. And uh, this is the uh, part two of uh, George Vakula's presentation on transcribing and digitizing early documents of Hatfield. And uh, we have uh, Mass Humanities to thank. This is part of our grant um, that was funded by Mass Humanities with funding that comes from the Mass Cultural Council. Um, and it's part of our uh, grant to build a digital volunteer program for the Hatfield Historical Society. Um, and by that, we are hoping to get a group of volunteers who will be willing to uh, do some transcribing for us of some of the great documents that we have um, in the next set of um, the last three of the six part series programs will be on researching genealogy, so families, and also on researching old homes. So I think those are gonna be great also. Um, we hope you will consider coming back for those. Um, and at the end of the next session, part three, we'll be letting you know what sorts of documents we have available to transcribe and also a way to, um, uh, you know, what's the way to kind of sign up with us to do that. Um, so uh, we hope that uh, we will see some of you there. So um, uh, again, for anybody who's gotten on uh, in the last few minutes, we are recording this program. We hope to have it up on our YouTube channel in the next week or so. Um, ideally in the next week before part three happens in case you missed the, the first ones. Um, but if you're willing to have your, your little face appear on the screen, we'd love to see you. Um, and now I'm going to uh, introduce Meg, who is the uh, assistant curator of the Hatfield Historical Museum, and she's going to tell you uh, how to do questions. Hello, I'm Meg, and I'm the assistant curator. <laughs> um, so what we please now, if everyone could find on your device where the chat button is, usually it's at the bottom of the screen. It'll go like the whole uh, menu at the bottom of your screen or sometimes at the top of the screen if it's an iPad. Um, we'll have different things of participants and chat and share screen and record and so on. So if you can find the chat button and click that, you don't need to enter anything right now. Um, but that's a way that you can ask questions and then I can, you know, sort of keep those in mind so that when we get to the Q and A at the end of the, uh, George's presentation, um, I'll be able to help those. Great. So if you feel like adding any comments there anyway, along, you can drop them to every, everybody. Um, you can also pull down a little menu if you want to send something just to me or, anybody else to say, Meg, can you ask this? Because I don't really want to. And I will. So that is my role. I can all, I'll be managing the tech end. Um, also, if you have tech troubles, you can ask just me or just Kathy, and that way we can get to you directly. Um, Bob Osley is the uh, board president of the Historical Society, and he will be introducing our guest speaker this evening. Good evening. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to this second installment of uh, uh, the transcribing, digitalizing early handwritten documents. Um, George will be teaching us about capturing, digitalizing, and transcribing uh, documents. Um, George, as you, some of you who attended the last week's session uh, are aware that uh, he had a 40 year career as an electrical engineer. Um, his skill set includes organizing, interpreting data, and he's been uh, very helpful in putting together and interpreting a lot of historical documents. Um, so he's a, a great resource uh, to be doing this. Um, he had in the past uh, transcribed a 1686 uh, day book of Samuel Billings, which was quite a feat in itself because of its length and, and its age. Um, George is a native of Hatfield and a member of the Historical Society of Hatfield. Um, so without any further intro, uh, let's welcome uh, George as tonight's presenter. Okay, the first thing I'm gonna do is um, share the screen, take the screen. 
and we'll get back to Okay, so this is the second class in a, in a sequence of three on transcribing and digitizing Hatfield's early handwritten documents. In the first class, we, we talked about reading and transcribing, uh, provided some guidelines. And in this one, it's really going to be how do we um, take those transcriptions and digitize them and get them to the point where they can be put into searchable documents. So just as a quick overview, I'm going to go through some of the, the guidelines uh, that we talked about last week, just a short review uh, to show that they're really simple. We're trying not to make this difficult for anyone. Um, one of the things that we want to include in any of our documents is a series of information that describes a document and kind of gives a little bit of background and includes um, who, who did the transcription, things like that. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And in order to keep this a little bit interesting, um, I'm gonna go through uh, not an entire transcription, but a short reading, uh, guided reading again, and show how a short document can end up in, in a file that will end up eventually um, as a Google Doc uh, document. We'll also have some examples uh, of long um, transcriptions and how to handle those using uh, Excel or Sheets. And then we'll have, this is not gonna be a class on Google Docs and Sheets, but we'll, we'll talk a little bit about um, what you'll need to actually access Google Docs and Sheets. <clears throat> so just a quick transcription guideline review. Um, really, again, wanting to make this very simple. We really just want to capture transcription line by line and maintain the integrity of, of the original document that we're transcribing and eventually digitizing. Uh, we'd like to capture the original text exactly as written. We want to see all the spellings, cross outs, orphan words, um, any, any quirks that a writer would have, we'd like to capture those, especially from the early documents. And the only thing would be if we, if we get into a little bit of trouble in understanding something or doing a transcription, uh, we'd like to denote that with a question mark with brackets around it. Again, very simple. And the last item on this list is in order to encourage people who maybe aren't too computer familiar uh, to do a transcription, they can do it on paper and then it can be digitized if, if, if that's required. Okay, the format information on these documents, there's some information that we'd like to capture on each of our files that we end up with, uh, with that include the transcriptions. Uh, maybe the document collection and a link if it's available, a short document description, a transcriber and date. We'd like everyone who does a transcription to get credit and to remember when it was done or to know when it was done. And anyone who does a review uh, which there probably will be on a lot of these early documents uh, and, and the data reviewer. So a reviewer and a date. And it's always good to include a location for notes. Uh, there's always things that seem to come up in every document that uh, you'd like to write some notes somewhere. So it's a good idea to actually add those to um, our transcriptions. There are some differences in a short document it would be good to you know, a one or two page document to include a facsimile, uh, just so that you get an idea of what it is you've actually transcribed from. Um, and also include keywords on short documents because if you're trying to do a search, uh, keywords become very important when there are a lot of files and trying to search for something, it's, it's important to get that right to allow people who are doing a search for documents and certain items to actually find them. A long documents, um, a little bit different, similar to keywords. I'm gonna show some examples of defining categories where we can enter items that'll help uh, in searches in, in an Excel-based or Sheets-based document, for example. And we'll have examples of those. You'll see some tonight. And we can even make some templates if that seems to be necessary. So let's just go to short documents. 
So what is it we want to do? We want to transcribe the doc document as it's written using the guidelines that we've, we've talked about. Accuracy is very important. And we want to include that format information that's listed or that we talked about earlier. And if necessary, I add this again for documents that are that use phonetic spelling. It's very difficult to, to, uh, to search for words in a document when the spelling is, is phonetic. Um, there's probably no way to figure out how someone is going to spell a word. So it's always good to, if necessary, again, translate that into modern language. And that should make searches much simpler. Okay, so assigning keywords to short transcriptions. I mean, this is pretty straightforward. Again, it's very important when you're doing a search and there are a lot of documents. And basically the keywords, uh, the answer who, what, when, where, and possibly even why. So who, who is the primary in the document, if there is one or two, uh, or maybe even more? What is the document? Uh, what, what kind of document is it? Is it a deed? Is it a a uh, contract? Is it a letter? Uh, when? I think it's important to know roughly, you know, in a, in a summary, what era are we talking about? When was the document written? And is it where? Is it from Hatfield? Does it involve any surrounding towns? It'd be nice to, to just capture that. And again, doing this, um, adding these keywords faithfully makes it much easier to search for items and find what you're really looking for when you're doing a search. So at this point, I'm going to do a, a quick uh, go go to a, a contract here. Do a quick guided reading, and we'll go through again blowing this up. I'm not going to read this whole thing. It's it's pretty long, but I'm going to read some of it and. There will be a point to this that you'll understand when I show you how to uh, what what this will look like in a in a in a document, um, in a transcribed document. So, whereas there is an agreement with the inhabitants of Springfield on the west side of the river. on the one part and Robert Pogue on the other part that the said Robert Pogue is to teach the children on the west side of the great river to read or write those that they send to me and for his recompense, there's a split word, they are to provide for me a place for to board in washing, lodging, and comfortable diet during the whole time that he is in the work of teaching till Michaelmas. So that's as far as I'm going to go on this. Um, this is, this is I mean, you can see that this is um, very uh, phonetic spelling. And this document seemed to make the point that I keep saying that it would be necessary, for example, to do a translation of this document uh, to modern English to actually find something. Um, just to point out some of the difficulties in reading it, uh, Robert here, who is going to teach someone how to read and write, uh, when you think about it, he, he uses um, O and E. One is on or one, depending on the context. Um, another interesting point is that you see this symbol right here? This is a W. But he uses this same symbol for uh, the letters U. So here's a during, but there's that symbol and a V. So where's the river? So here's river. There's that same symbol. So he has this symbol he uses for W, U, and V. Uh, he seems to add a lot of E's to the end of words. Um, 
And again, you can see that this is a candidate definitely for, in my opinion, definitely for a translation. So one of the things we can do now is we can go to, let's see, do a new share and I can show you the So this would be a, this is a Word document, but it could be uploaded to, to Google Docs. And what I tried to do in here is follow the rules. Uh, the Hatfield Historical Museum, the collection is a digital commonwealth. We have a link. It's a very short document description defining um, what the document is, uh, people, the people mentioned in it, and its date. So um, capture the transcriber here. Uh, I think I'm not sure exactly when I did this, but I think there was a file that was labeled at this date that, uh, again, I didn't follow my own rules initially because I didn't make them yet. Uh, so there's a transcriber and a date reviewer. I've been reviewing it the last couple of days. Uh, keywords, who are the people? Robert Pogue, Ebenezer Jones, Nathaniel Morgan. It's a schoolmaster contract. And it's dated July 4th, 1700, and the two towns involved are Hatfield and West Springfield. We included a facsimile of the document. And this is what I'm talking about as a translation. So the black, the black line here is line for line transcription of what's in that document. And then what I did was I, beneath each line, I just went through and read and wrote that line in modern English. So that if someone does want to do a search, they'd end up searching for, uh, for example, if you look at the way he, he writes Jones here, it's G-O-A-N-E-S. I believe that's Jones. Nathaniel Morgan with an E, Morgan. Um, just to even find the names of, of people uh, would be much simpler with this translation. So that's the point that I wanted to make there. So that's, that's, this is an example. Oh, and one more thing I forgot here at the end, just have a place for notes. So one of the things that he talks about in, in the, uh, in his contract is if he gets sick and he can't continue. And one of the sicknesses is his throne sickness. Well, I, I had no idea what that was. So I looked, I looked it up. Uh, there was nothing that I could find that was actually throne sickness, but um, the King's evil came up uh, as a, a form of tuberculosis, which was prevalent at the time, 1700, um, that uh, might be what he's referring to as throne sickness. So again, I just took some notes, um, typed in or wrote in some of the uh, items that I found in this website here. So this is just an example of, of a document and includes the items that we talked about. And it would be, be nice if we could do something similar to this for the short documents that, that are transcribed. So let me go back to the presentation. Oops, wrong one. I think I uh, somehow I got mixed up here. Let me let me go back down to where I want to be here. Okay, we just did that. The next thing we want to do. Oh. Okay, that's that document. Somehow I got mixed up there. All right, long documents. Talk a little bit about those. So a long document several pages, 100 pages, however long. There are several uh, journals in, in the um, museum's collection that are possible for transcription. But again, what are the things we want to do? We want to transcribe that document as it's written and enter the items into a spreadsheet. Again, use, use the guidelines for consistency that we've talked about. Um, one of the things in a long document is we probably ought to assign one or even a short, a, a small number of pages to individual transcribers. I, I don't know if 
you know, we can have multiple people work on uh, the same document, which would be good um, instead of having someone try to transcribe a, a, a 200 page document, which, which is probably not uh, too good. Uh, but what we'd want to do is include page and line numbers, include the format elements that we talked about earlier. And since we're on a spreadsheet, we, we do that information on a separate sheet. And again, accuracy is important in the transcription. Oops. One of the important things that we'll talk about uh, in some of the examples, I'll define and describe to you what I'm talking about when I say we, we want to uh, define categories that we can then use to search and filter for, for different kinds of things. And I'll show you examples of, of that. Um, it's important to I think go through initially before we start on a long document and talk about these categories and establish what they are. We'd like everybody to use the same set of categories and fill them in as, uh, as the information is actually transcribed and entered into the, into the spreadsheet. And one of the things, again, like, like the keywords with short documents, we'd like the items that are entered into these categories. They're not going to affect the actual transcription, but we'd like them to be to use modern, modern language so that, again, they're easily searched. And again, at the end, if it's necessary, sometimes the transcriptions, and I'll show you an example with the Samuel Billing uh, account book, where maybe a translation is, is necessary in addition to having these um, categories and the items in the categories in modern language. Okay, so just assigning them, um, again, I think I said most of this, but um, what they're for, and I'll show you some examples, is to make it easier to um, filter items and find people, for example, um, find what happened on a certain date, for example. Um, and just to make it simpler to do searches. And in, in the next class, um, I'll show some examples of actually looking through Hatfield's vital records using the categories and the items in them that uh, you can answer some pretty, pretty interesting questions about what happened in Hatfield um, in its history. Again, use modern language to, to categorize the items um, and it allows you again to, to search by family name date. You can find the number of births, deaths, marriages, for example, for a family or, or by date. Okay, we have a long document. Um, what I'm gonna do is show you, this is a picture of two pages, again, that Peter Thomas uh, photoed photocopied or photographed out of the uh, Hatfield on the right and church records. And the example that I'm going to show is how I would take these and how I did take these, um, put them in a spreadsheet and assign the categories. And we'll walk through that. So let's see. First, let's, let's go to Let's just go to the next one of these as an example. So here's, here's the example of the Hatfield Town Records. So you can see what the original looks like. And this was already a transcription. Um, it's not clear whether it was uh, modern language. There's a little bit, of, little bit of spelling here. It looks like it was consistent with what was there in 1670, sorely burnt. Um, but what we'll do is I'll show you how, how I took this and put it into a spreadsheet and then assign categories to allow us to do filtering on certain items. So again, remember you have, you have a date. Uh, so for 1670, there were two deaths and then a description of each of those deaths. So let's go to this. So we'll go to the spreadsheet. <clears throat> so here's the spreadsheet that I made up. Ooh. And I neglected to, uh, 
I was, I was practicing before I neglected to uh, put this back to the beginning. But so the, the actual text that's transcribed, this should look very similar if you remember that um, original document to what you see there. There's, there's a column with the text date, the as written text. And then what I talk, when, I, when I talk about categories, there's, we wanted to capture a document, the page and the line number for each of these items in that list or in that document. And then the categories that I talked about are, are these, the columns in my spreadsheet. So for example, what, what is it you'd want to capture out of this? Um, well, there's a date of the death. So we capture the year, the month, and the day. If you read through these, just the first couple, what else do you see here? Well, they show, they give you a name of who it is that died, first name. They tell you the relationship to someone. In this case, so the last name, Ruth, Richard and Ruth Morton. Hannah died. She was the daughter of Samuel and Hannah Gillette. So when I was going through this, I said, well, what, what do we really want to capture? We, we, we want to capture the first name of whoever it is that died and their last name. Capture the relationship and who are they related to? And then one of the interesting things is in the later uh, vital records in Hatfield, they actually give the causes. These are, these are early here, but there's very little causes that are given uh, in the early documents. Uh, the causes start to be entered more um, often uh, in the 1700s, maybe 1770, 100 years later or so. Um, the town, sometimes there's a death of someone from another town. And as I said, it's always good to put a notes column in here so you can write any notes to yourself. And then the source. And the reason that I have the source here is because they're both town records and church records. And when I put this spreadsheet together, I put them together uh, in one spreadsheet so that uh, I'd be able to do searches a little bit better and search all of them at once. So I can search either one or, or all or both uh, records. The information sheet that I talked about, we put as, a, as another sheet in the, in the uh, spreadsheet here. So the document collection, this is the actual file name. Uh, again, Peter Thomas put these together, um, which was really, really good uh, to, to help us uh, put this information together. A short description, photocopied, um, formatted and when it was done uh, transcribed I, I don't I didn't write down when I actually did this but it was sometime probably in February I think Peter Peter did these uh, late last year maybe um, well actually 9 30 2020 and over the winter I was able to go through and and uh, put this spreadsheet together and I probably reviewed it but uh, again not, I haven't uh, written that down. But it would be good to do that if someone else did it as to write down who, who did it. Okay, so what we want to do is I'm going to go to I have one more example. So this was the Hatfield records. If we go Yeah, one more example here of, again, this is the Samuel Billing account book. And I'd like to go through some of that. So I'm not gonna, again, read through all of this. We're just focus on just a piece of it here. But one of the things, this is pretty easy to read. Rebecca went to school. You can see Samuel did a cross I didn't spell school correctly, but he did it over here to and this is widow Alice. And he, he got a little bit confused, I think, that the, the D should go the other way, but he 
it looks like Webo. This looks like one of his bees, but it should be a D, Webo Alice. And in, and this is January. So again, he didn't use J's very much. He used I's, January 18th, 1691. So Rebecca happens to be his stepdaughter. Uh, his, his first wife died. And th this, this line here um, documents, I think, his marriage. So the 30 of December marriage, 1691. But he didn't put his wife's name in there, which was interesting. But a year later, Thankful Billing was born, the third day of December, year 1692. So again, I'm not going to go through any more of this. Um, you can see there's a lot of it. Some of it gets a little more uh, difficult to uh, interpret. And let me let me go to the spreadsheet for this. Oops. Uh, no, I have to I have to find the right spreadsheet here. Uh oh, having a little trouble finding my spreadsheet here. Oh, I know why. Because I want to stay there and I need to go here. Okay. All right. So this this is the this is the spreadsheet for the Samuel Billing account book, and again, what we have is the the day book, the entry here. This is the actual text that's entered, and you can see here Rebecca went to school to Webo. I probably should be a B there. Webo Alice in January eighteenth, sixteen ninety one, and his marriage. 1691 and thankful billing was born. So this is the actual text. And as we'd like to do, we entered the, 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 the journal actually has page numbers. So that's numbered on page one. On the scan, that's page four. So I've entered both of those. And again, line numbers here. So these, this one is a little more complicated in that there are several per people sometimes since this is a this is an account book there there are several people involved so i had person a um, person b and person c and you could probably go on with this but i decided to stop at well three here but there's hardly anybody in the third column so uh, there are some in the second column so so there may be two people uh, uh, to talk about here so the first person the last name and again we want to use the uh, modern spellings for the last name, the first name of that person, where are they from? Because a lot of the uh, transactions were from people who lived in towns around Hatfield. What type of transaction? Again, it's an account book. So was it a debt? Was it a credit? Um, you can actually see if you do this. And then these, these items here, what I've done is I filtered on all of these uh, items in, in the spreadsheet. So one of the things you can do is just click on this and you'll be able to see all the different types of transactions. So there's accounts, births, there's bounties, credits, debts, when someone died, uh, discharge, I'm not sure what that is. I remember uh, estates, marriages, somebody paid, they reckoned, there's a sale, some items for school, so the Rebecca went to school is, is would be found by filtering on, on that item. Again, the, the other people, the kind of common things that you'd like to include would be when, when it's there, uh, he was very inconsistent in writing uh, when some of these accounts took place, but the year, the month, the day, if it's available. And probably the most important um, category here is to talk about or try to describe and capture an event or an item. 
So you can see some of the options here, or some, some of the items that I put in here. So he was a stonemason. So he ended up building a lot of chimneys. Um, he worked the land. He did sheep shearing, mowing, traveling. And again, you can, because we filtered all these, you can filter on all these and you see things like their alphabetical order, but uh, it'll pick out um, items that talked about apples, axes, bacon, and this just goes on and on for all the different kinds of things that um, he did or events that occurred. So and I'll show you some examples of how to use this uh, in, in a minute here. So the other, the other thing I also captured was, um, since he's talking about money, pound, shilling, and pence, he captured that. And he also talked because he had, in some cases, he talked about three bushels of wheat. You can capture the number three, uh, if it's bushels of wheat, or for, here's an example, he talked about four sheep. So for shearing four sheep, he charged nine pence. So what we can do with, with these is filter on all these items. And I'll, sh I'll show you some examples of, of that in a moment here. So one of the things I wanted to do was, for example, let's, let's find all the references to the Coles, Coles family in this account book. And what it, <clears throat> so all I had to do was pick out, pick out calls and eliminate everybody else. And then what we can see is all the references here to the Coles family. So there's the last name, different members of the Coles family, John, Jonathan, looks like John and Jonathan are the only two. They have credits and debts reckonings where they decide who, who owes what to whom at the end, um, to even the accounts. So there's one example, the Coles family. And what we can do is if we don't want to filter on him, let's do another one. Let's do the uh, Partridge family. And what we get is all of the references in the account book for the Partridge family. So Samuel, um, Samuel is also Mr. Partridge. He was a very important person. Captain Partridge, Captain Samuel Partridge, same person probably. And Mr. Mr. and Captain, and he got promoted, so he's Colonel. So these, these are pretty much all Samuel Partridge. But the idea is that in, in entering all the values into these categories, it becomes very easy to do filtering and to pick out um, different families and, and what their, oops, you do that. I'm gonna get everybody back. So select all, get everybody back. The other interesting thing is it's, it's interesting to, to see <clears throat> here. Um, let's look for references to tobacco. So there's tobacco spelled with a modern spelling. And we find all the references in here to tobacco. But note, note the spellings. There's one. There's another one, and there's yet another one, and another one. They're all they're all phonetic, and they all seem to be different um, over time. There was just no consistency in um, the spelling back then. But again, doing this, entering these these categories and the items in the categories makes it very easy to. Um, filter. The other interesting thing is let's let's keep going down. So let's not look at tobacco, but let's look at travel. And there's 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 kind of an art to defining the categories and what you're going to put in them. I mean you'd like to you'd like to capture as much 
um, information is you get, if you get too specific, then you have a lot of items and a lot of different things to look up. Uh, so there's some, there's a trade-off there to um, try to get the right um, balance in doing this. So let's look, let's, let's look at travel. So one of the things Samuel Billing, again, kept his account book and, and he would rent out his horse and we can just look at some of the places that people went um, back then. So Deerfield, Northfield, Springfield, Deerfield, Springfield. And we keep going down the list, Hartford, Windsor, Hartford, Wethersfield, Hartford, Windsor, Boston, Boston. And again, it goes on. So you get an idea of People just didn't stay in Hatfield, but they actually moved around quite a lot um, and went, went pretty far on um, Samuel's horse. So those are two examples and hopefully you get an idea of um, what it's like or what you can do with, with a document if you put it in this format and actually uh, if you're researching something in Hatfield, you can, you can find references pretty quickly doing this. So let's see. So I'm going to go back to my original document. Okay, that was the Sammy Billing account book. Um, and as I said, just talk just a little bit about Google Docs and Sheets. Um, this seemed to be the best way or a convenient way to actually capture um, the documents that are going to be transcribed to make them available to uh, a large audience. Um, to, to, use, to use Google Docs and Sheets, so you need a Gmail account. So one thing to do would be you'd have to download Google Chrome, uh, set up your account, and then once you have that email account, um, the documents can be mailed, made available to it. Uh, by the Historical Society and anyone who then you, uses uh, Gmail can, can actually access those documents. Okay, just as a recap, um, class one, we, we talked about reading and transcribing documents. Uh, in this class, it was actually capturing the, the digitized version that we could search and upload uh, and use. So we talked about capturing on, on paper or using an application. We want to be, we don't want it to provide, you know, make things too strict. What, whatever anybody can use to do a, a transcription and, and capture it in some digital manner would be good. Um, and eventually we're going to upload those documents. And th again, this is a work in progress, so we probably don't have all of the details worked out on how to do that. But uh, one of the things I thought of is uh, when I was writing this was there should be some descriptive file name. So for the examples that, that I showed there, perhaps we could have uh, the Robert Pogue, the, the file name would be contract Robert Pogue in 1700. It gives a pretty short description uh, in the file name of what, what you're looking for as the Samuel Billing Journal, Journal Samuel Billing 1686. And again, it, it tells you rough what it, what it is, who the primary is, and roughly what the era is. So in the next class, um, I showed you some of the filtering that you can do with Excel, but, but there are other things that you can do with a little higher level language um, and putting things together and answering questions that you might not even have thought of about Hatfield's history. <clears throat> so we'll have some examples of uh, focusing on uh, the vital records in, in Hatfield and um, showing some of the things that we can do quickly um, with those uh, to, for example, provide to, to people who, whose uh, ancestors lived in Hatfield and, and come to town looking for information. Uh, we can put together pretty quickly some some things to uh, give them um, uh, 
when they when they come and, and ask. Uh, and the last part of the next class will be available projects. And I think Kathy will talk about that and how to go about actually becoming a volunteer and, and transcribing and uh, helping us to do a number of transcriptions at, at the Historical Society. Okay, and that's the end of my presentation. If there are any questions. There are a couple of questions. Um, <coughs> I'm just going to see about ending the screen share. Do, do, do. And I talked so, well, so much about that at the beginning, like, oh, I can do this so easily. And now I'm, there we go, okay. Um, <clears throat> the first question is, um, you mentioned in the long document, um, possibly breaking them up between multiple people. Is it more useful to have one person get really familiar with someone's handwriting writing and stylistic quirks or more useful to have multiple sets of eyes on the same um, writing? Well, I, th I think one person, if they were willing to do a large document, would probably, uh, you know, be more consistent. But in a large document, I don't think we can count on having somebody, you know, transcribe it. The same of building a comic book was a couple hundred pages. Um, a lot of work. It took, took quite a while. It's There's still some that's not quite done yet uh, in there, too. So that's a possibility um, to add pages to... Uh, to what I what you see in that spreadsheet, but um, I think the idea is to get people to volunteer to help, and 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 we don't want to turn anybody away by saying, "Here, go do this 200-page document." I mean, it'd be good to, you know, you practice if you like it, you 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 help out if you don't, well, you move on. That is very true. Um, we have a couple other questions. Uh, one, it's going back, um, about the way that different family names are spelled. And you kind of touched on this a little bit about whether with, with the tobacco illustration mm -hmm. that catching all of the different spellings is useful, but to find in the, uh, sort of in the, the categories list, a standardized way so that you can search for mm -hmm. one spelling, the modern current spelling, and then that will catch all of the uh, optional spellings is that mm -hmm. that's how you'd handle family names as well yes yeah I think family names uh, especially I mean an example um, of that is in in the documents I mean I, I've looked into the Wilkie family and it's, it was spelled w-i-l-k-e-e -E early on and then somewhere along the line it became w-i-l-k-i-e and when you go through these documents, what you find is, well, that happened when Joseph Lyman came to town, um, the new minister. He decided he was going to spell it with an IE, and that's what it ended up being um, till today. <laughs> that's pretty funny. Um, Peter, can you go ahead and unmute yourself? You have a com uh, question about oral transcription. Yeah, one of the things that I've been trying um, is there's a program uh, that allows you to actually read the document and it translate that, translates that into a Word document uh, in terms of what you, know, what you said. Mm -hmm. it, it takes a bit of getting used to on the part of your computer because it has to understand the oral inflections and things that characterize your voice and you have to indicate when a sentence ends and when a new one begins or a new line um, but and I'm still working on it but I was curious uh, to see whether anybody else had ever tried something like that it, it it's going to take practice and it's not foolproof but I think with enough use of it it could be a very handy tool. Uh, George has done a wonderful job of reading some of these documents and um, he's been great at it. I've been following along uh, and uh, sometimes I have paused and I've been, I've been doing this for quite a while and, and he's got it right. Uh, so, but <laughs> I think in terms of reading a document, you can actually have a word transcription of it and then you have to go in and edit it. 
Yeah. But at least you have it. Um, yeah, Peter, I, I've, I've tried some of that um, to see how it would work. Um, and what I found is basically what you said. You, you, it, it's a little bit awkward. Uh, the, the, uh, the software that does the trans, translation or transcription um, really needs to learn your voice. So there's, a, there's quite a bit of a learning there with the software. I think they have a software now that, that does learn your voice and does a better job. Uh, the one thing I found though too, is if, if you go back in time, some of the words are different and it doesn't understand the words. I mean, the, the words just aren't in their dictionaries. So um, again, I tried it and eventually, like you said, you have to go back and, and fix you know, all the things that didn't quite work. Yeah. So. I think you, I, I found that particularly with account books is there's a whole, particularly in Pynchon's account books from the 1600s, uh, particularly when you get the varieties of cloth, there are mm -hmm. so many names for different, even subtle yeah. changes in the number of threads per inch or whatever, uh, in mm -hmm. terms of names, a, a modern dictionary would never have them. I love that. That's that's my favorite part. <laughs> um, I can also see, Peter, that your uh, idea of of having a oral transcription wouldn't I mean it, it could also help make it more accessible for people who were having trouble reading. It'd be great to have the original and an oral translation that was correct, you know, that someone had read and checked. And that way you could have, we could have this little video of here is the piece and here is what it says as someone reads it. It would be really, really neat. Um, Kathy, you had a question about- um, uh, my, my question was about, um, George, when you were showing like uh, the version of a line by line transcription where like the top line was, you know, as written and then in a different color underneath the second line was the, you know, using modern language. Um, so I guess my question would be, and again, as George said, we don't have this all quite figured out yet, you know, because um, we're getting to it as we come to it. But um, like, would it make more sense to have one document that was the whole, you know, original transcription and then a second document that was, you know, the modern language one? So you could just kind of, you know, if you wanted to, if you didn't want to wade through that, you could just read the whole modern language one. Um, yeah, I mean, you could do it that way. I, I, I did it. I mean, the way I did it was to just line for line and stuck it in there and made it a different color. I mean, that's, you know, you could read one color and, and uh, get your original document and you could read right. the other color and, and get the, the translation. So right. there, there are probably a lot of ways to do it. Right. So I think a lot of those things will just, you know, kind of figure them out as we go along as to what we want people to do, or maybe we have the option and we just, you know, we'll, we'll see as it goes along. The usefulness of having the translation done even, even that much is so huge because then there's a, a modern text version that we could, if we needed to pull out. And you know, even if it took retyping, if this, is, if this is the modern text for this original document, which is really cool. Are there yeah. any other questions for anyone else? No, Liz, you had a question, but it uh, looks like it was answered that uh, George answered it about the different spellings. Yeah, and um, uh, I don't, there's no, one, no other questions in the chat, but oh, go ahead, Liz. I did have one other one. I was wondering whether the Historical Society was thinking about being the main repository for these docu transcribed documents or would are there plans or is there sort of a history of submitting them to someplace else like Digital Commonwealth or Archive.org or some other places that house these kinds of things? And so that's part A of my question. And part B is, and if so, do they have ways that they like things to be done that we should be looking at when doing this? Shall I try to take does that? that? Make, does that make sense? I'm, I don't know if that's a real question for this group, but yeah. I thought I'd ask it. <clears throat> There's always someone troublesome asking questions like these. Um, <laughs> so um, anyway, um, 
I'm not sure we had gotten that far yet. I mean, uh, we'd love to have them once they're uh, transcribed uh, be available, say, on our Digital Commonwealth page or our archive.org page, which is also kind of part of the Digital Commonwealth. The way items get up to those sites now is that you have the Boston Public Library come, you apply, they take things away, they scan them, and then they put them up into those pages. Um, I have talked to them in the past about us being able to add things ourselves or even being able to go in and adjust our intro text or something. Mm -hmm. um, and they have plans at least for the latter so that you can go in and adjust your, your kind of uh, introductory text, but they haven't gotten there yet. Um, okay. And so I don't, my, I don't know as, as there is a plan to be able to let individual organizations be able to upload their own things because I think they do have a lot of requirements and rules and uh, a lot of that is for the metadata. You know, you, you need right. to know what sorts of metadata is needed and submit it to them in the right form. So in, so for instance, even all of our items that are up there now, um, you know, we had to submit kind of a basic spreadsheet that listed all the source of information that George was saying we should have in the file, um, as well as like condition and whatnot. But the metadata, you know, I'm not a librarian. Um, so they often did the metadata part taking mm -hmm. all that basic information from the, um, from the spreadsheet. So kind of that answers your question, not, not fully, but. The other, no, the no, other key great. to your great. question, I think Liz, is that they, they don't house translations on the okay. Commonwealth as far as I know. So that the translations you know, would, would be okay. our, you know, that's something that, that is our responsibility and that we'll get to put up and things like that. Um, I'd love Can it I if they- one? I know I do too. Um, can I ask one more thing about the question about the uh, name issue? How do you decide which is the modern spelling of the name? Well, <laughs> a, lot, a lot of a lot of people um, still live in Hatfield. Yes. Uh, with, with names from 350 years ago, so we uh, try to use that, and maybe in some cases uh, we don't get it right. Um, Coles I was looking example. at some deeds and there's a name that is wonderfully spelled a hundred different ways and finally ends up in the 50s on a gravestone as one format of it. Um, so I was just thinking about that if we ever got around to that particular set of documents that it's it's an interesting question and I love that it's so variable with that particular family. It was There's at least 10 different ways it's spelled and it doesn't seem to follow any kind of historical pattern. It just was whatever they happened to put it on there at the at the moment. It was great. Yeah. So I, I think the important thing would be to group those into one spelling, whatever it is you end up yeah. with, and, and leave it at that, whether it's uh, the latest or not. Like Gary Coles uh, has his name C-O-W-L-E-S. And I think on my spreadsheet, I have C-O-W-L-S. So yeah. Um, it's just co Kozash. And again, it was it's, uh, a million it, different ways. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah, and, and oftentimes, um, oftentimes families would split and they would stop talking to each other. And so they would slightly change their name or change their name more um, because they kind of didn't want to be associated with the other part of the family anymore. So um, that happens too. All, all part of the excitement of. Or if you have, if you have six brothers who all have the same name, it can be useful to have them have like, oh, that's John Cole spelled this way or you know, spelled this way. And that can differentiate him from the John Coles spelled this other way, who is the junior of this. Anyway, names are complex. Um, yes. It's 730. So I just want to do a quick time check. And if there are any more questions or where else we need to. Everything else. Okay. I'm not seeing any more. I just had one, a couple of thoughts. It, a, a lot of what George is using are really 17th and 18th century documents, and they certainly exist. And I think treating them the way he's suggesting uh, is important in terms of maybe two different lines. By the time you hit the 19th century, spellings tend to be more consistent. And so I've often just used the brackets. If it's a real word that's a, uh, it's important, but 
it doesn't quite ring true with modern phonetics. I'll put it in brackets, but most of the time you can read those. And so I find that a more comfortable text to read if you have to combine the two. I mean, reading a translated one or an un one, I get both, but sometimes that's another way of condensing it. Mm -hmm. the, the other thing I've tried with the Conway records is to do a transcription on one page and or the, ori uh, the original on one page and a transcription on another. And so if you, if you want to read the original, you read the left-hand page. And if you want to read the, the transcribed one, you read the right-hand page. Um, so it, it's, it's varied. Um, yeah, there are a lot of ways to do this. I mean, I think we're trying to make it simple, uh, simplest that we can and uh, encourage people to actually volunteer and try to, try to help out to, to do these things. Okay, uh, looks like it, um, and we're past 7.30. Meg, if you could just throw that last uh, screen up on the page yeah. again. If I, can, if I can get to it. Okay, oh, if you can, you. not a problem. Um, <laughs> All the technology. So uh, anyway, I just want to uh, thank, first of all, George, our presenter, um, did a great job, not only for your presentation, but also for um, all the tons of transcription that you've done over the last several years. Um, it's really been a lot. I mean, that uh, day book um, in particular, um, all of the data, not only that you've transcribed, but put into those spreadsheets to really be able to explain relationships between people. Um, and a lot of people who've been visiting from some of these early settler families from across the country, uh, George has come in and met with a bunch of them to kind of go through the spreadsheet, you know, here's all the Alice references. And like, so your, your descendant, uh, I mean, your ancestor, you know, paid for schooling with eggs and, um, you know, he built a chimney for him and um, just really being able to show, kind of get an idea of what it was actually like to live in Hatfield um, during those early times, which is really pretty cool. Um, so also want to thank our uh, funders, uh, the grant from Mass Humanities. We couldn't have done this program without that. And they get their funding from the Mass Cultural Council. Um, if you haven't signed up for other programs in the series, um, you can go to our website on the events page. The link is right there on the screen as well. Um, so this will be up on the YouTube channel uh, sometime the next week. Um, and so you can sign up for other things if you haven't signed up already. Um, and also just, we hope that some of you will consider volunteering for us. Uh, we'll talk more about that. Meg and I will talk about that at the end of uh, George's uh, program next week, the final transcription program um, as to the sorts of documents that are available. And, you know, we're, um, there'll be lots of easier documents available too. They're not gonna be like the 1686 day book. Um, probably better to start with something a little simpler. And, um, and we'll be, you know, working through all these things, you know, so we'll also be asking volunteers just to give their uh, recommendations and suggestions of ways to do things better as we go along. Um, so uh, please consider uh, volunteering and we'll have a way for people to sign up at the end of uh, the session next week. And if you're not already a member of the Hatfield Historical Society, consider joining because then you'll get notice about all these events and things. And uh, just to remind you that um, this program and the rest like it um, are also uh, funded and sponsored by the Hatfield Historical Society and we can't do it without support from the community. So um, please consider uh, donating if you haven't already. So thanks everybody for coming so much. It's been really fun and we hope to see you next week. Thank you, George. People can feel free to unmute yourself and say goodbye if you like. Thank you, George. That was great. Yeah. Interesting. Thanks. Yeah, Thank thanks, you. Thanks, I don't know how you knew that that was Alice, though. Yeah, I don't either. <laughs> Widow Alice, I'm like. <laughs> Widow Alice, I'm looking at that and thinking, oh, that just would have made me cry. Well, you, you, get, you get to know the names of the people that lived in town. Yeah. And if you... Again, as I, I said in the uh, 
last session, sometimes just speaking the letters, mm -hmm. uh, you get the phonetic of what it looks like just from just from the letters. And you say say the letters out loud even, and you end up with Alice. The thing I do is, is like try to write it. Like if there's a word I can't figure out, I'm like, okay, how would my hand have to move to make those shapes and what might that be? And sometimes it helps. <laughs> All right. Great. Thanks everybody. Thank you. See you Thanks. soon. Bye. Have a nice night.